Hi, everybody. This is Brian Judd. I'm the speaker of tonight's webinar and course, uh, Book Selling University course, BSU 100, about the introduction. Okay, just kind of an overview of non-bookstore marketing, special sales marketing. You may have heard this is non-traditional marketing, but they're all the same thing. So just as a little introduction of me, I am the executive director of the Association of Publishers for Special Sales. And I've also had a lot of experience in book marketing and special sales marketing, particularly on both sides of the desk. I was a, a VP of a Fortune 250 company, and I was I had to purchase a lot of, of promotional items for my, my company. And now I'm on the other side of the desk selling to them. And I've written books about that and books about book marketing in general. So I have a lot of experience in a variety of aspects of book marketing in general and special sales in particular. What to expect from uh, tonight's course about Book Selling University? One, just a definition of what special sales marketing is. Again, you may have heard it called uh, non-traditional marketing, uh, non-bookstore marketing, special sales. It's all the same thing. And we'll be looking at what that is and how you can utilize that to sell more of your books more, more profitably. I think. Then look at the the benefits of special sales marketing so you can see more reasons why you should be doing this and why more people should be doing it. <clears throat> then we look at the steps for selling the books, non-bookstore retailers and non-retail buyers. Those are the two major parts of special sales, of retail and non-retail. So we'll be looking at that and not in detail. Tonight's the overview and the other courses will be in much more detail on each one of these topics. But what we want to do is show you how you can sell a lot of books in Special sales marketing, these people, particularly the non-retail buyers, buy in large non-returnable quantities. So you can sell 5, 10, 20,000 books at a time. It's not unheard of at all. We do that on a regular basis. <clears throat> so how do most publishers see book marketing in general? Well, like this. <laughs> they spend a lot of money with no returns. I certainly can understand that. I I have written a lot of books on a variety of topics and, and spent a lot of money in the production and in the marketing area. Not all the books did had uh, had the same return as I had hoped, but uh, this is the way I looked at it. <laughs> you just uh, just keep spending and spending and spending, and eventually you do get something. But it's it could take long, a long term results for that to happen. A lot of people contact me and they'll say they spent all their money on production. You don't have enough money left over for the uh, marketing of it, the promotion of it. So what we'll look at special sales and, mar and as an, an investment in helping you recoup a lot of your initial investment in book marketing and, and in the production area. So we know what book marketing looks like. Now, what does special sales look like? And before I get this picture in there, I just want to show you or tell you that most people look at the uh, special sales market or the book marketing in general is just as you might look at a tree trunk. <laughs> just they just see that that what it looks like as the the tree. They don't look at what the uh, the opportunities could be around that. So what I'll, this is what I think special sales marketing looks like. And most people say, well, there's the the tree, which is analogous to the uh, to the uh, bookstore segment. They don't think about some of these other opportunities. But if you look closer, maybe you'll see. Some faces up here in the trees, and these are what I this is what I think of, of book marketing that that or special sales marketing that these are there but people don't necessarily see them. So that is the what we'll look at as the opportunity for special sales is finding the opportunities that others don't see. <clears throat> Most of the authors and publishers that I know do not pursue this. They just look at. Amazon or Barnes and Noble or the independent stores or maybe libraries, and that's the extent of their sales opportunities. But if you can look at some of these other other parts that I'll be showing you tonight, I think you'll be a lot more successful selling your books. So this is what a lot of people look at special sales is just finding new markets, and which is certainly a big part of that. They have their their bookstore sales, and they they, they sell they. they the typical life cycle that they have, the introduction, the maturity, the decline. <clears throat> and then they, they go out and they find some new markets. Well, I think I'll sell to some maybe airport stores and supermarkets. 
Well, that is certainly a part of special sales, but it's not the, uh, like the, the, the bulk of it, the place where you find most of your opportunities. What special sales that I think of the opportunity is like this, where you still have that life cycle, but you have new markets. And then you, you can add uh, different formats, certainly selling your book in, uh, for example, as a if you have a printed book, maybe selling it as an audio book or as an ebook, or maybe a, a spiral bound book or even a, 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 a DVD or corporations may just use your content or want your comp content in the form of a, a seminar or a workshop. So you always have these different formats, which so, and then the different users. I wrote a series of job search books, and I'll demonstrate this concept to you, showing some of my books. And the uh, I found new users as far as uh, colleges and state governments and uh, the Hispanic marketplace and, and uh, counselors and uh, unemployment agencies of people that I could who needed the information in my books. And new uses for the book. I sold it as a, as a textbook. Actually, on the last page of my book, Job Search 101, that I had a story which I thought pretty much encompassed or encapsulated the entire job search. I had that on one page. And one evening, I got a call from a young lady from the University of Texas. And she asked me what I meant by that story. And I told her. She said, thank you. Our professor said it'll be a question on our test tomorrow. What did the author mean by that story? <laughs> so she called me. And with that, as, as a result of having my book used or sold it as a textbook in several different universities and colleges. Creative promotion. This is really a major part of special sales, finding new ways in order to, to sell your books. <clears throat> For example, we had a one client was a consumer products company. They're <clears throat> introducing a stain remover. And we came up with a little booklet that had one of our clients had a series of a, bar, a, a cookbook with barbecue recipes in it. So we created a little booklet with these barbecue recipes in it. And they bought 300,000 of these to test. And they're saying that their stain remover could remove a stain caused by any of these uh, recipes. So I hope that that test goes well, because <laughs> if they order 300,000 just to test, there should be a nice order once that comes through. So you can have a little bit of creative promotion and you can really stimulate your revenue, your profits and your sales that way. So I'll show you how I did that. And these examples of books that I have written and they're all out of print. So I'm just using these as examples, not trying to, uh, to sell them to you. So this is the first book that I wrote of Job Search 101. And when I did it, this is back in the early 1990s and I, did some research and found out there were about 8 million people unemployed. And I did some research and found out that about 6 million of those wanted just general job search information on how to write a cover letter, a resume, interviewing skills. So given that information, where would you start marketing your book? Well, I, I agree, for 6 million people. So I started selling it through bookstores and learned a couple of things. One, that Unemployed people don't buy books because they're they don't unemployed. They don't want to spend the money. And two, there are 426 other books with the same research, I guess, that I did, and they're on these same topics. So I had to find new ways of finding those. So I was looking at, I asked the question of who else could use the content, the information in my book. So I thought college students, state governments. Uh, so I, I, even the parents of, of the college students, I did a direct ma mail program to the parents of, co of college students. But the, the idea of this research is very important. We have this one course by Amy Collins of uh, Book Selling University, BSU course 118, about how to do this research. So that will show you information about that. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side was a a niche of about a million people that knew how to write resumes and cover letters and interview, but they, they've been at a job for a, a year or more and they just had a bad attitude. So I wrote <clears throat> Coping with Unemployment to help them. And I found out something interesting that this was a great book, as you might surmise, but it did not sell well in bookstores because people did not want to be seen buying a book called Coping with Unemployment. <laughs> So I found a, a catalog called the Brown Wrapper Bookstore that sold non-pornographic books that people don't want to be seen buying. And it did very well in that catalog and because it, it, was, a, it was a very well-reviewed book and well-written well book. Obviously. 
It's also a good example of a bad cover. It's I found out that negativity is not good, that coping with unemployment title was not good, and also the image of that uh, person. I, I wanted the image to reflect the way I felt when I was out of a job for a year. But if you did make a copy, it's a Xerox copy to send to somebody, the only thing that shows up is the white lettering. And I just learned about that, but the, the content was good and it didn't so well through that catalog. But then on the right-hand side, the people had a great attitude. They knew how to write a, a resume and cover letter. So I had another niche of a million people there. I wrote, help wanted inquire within. And that was how to find job search opportunities that are not in the uh, on, not on, uh, online or not in newspapers. So this was information of where to search. And that actually led to a, my other book, Beyond the Bookstore, which I'll show you momentarily. So let's still look at different kinds of format to, to reach different groups and different users and new uses and different formats. This, again, we're still trying to extend that life cycle curve. So I did an interview of, of a uh, an audio program, a DVD, a video on how to do this, because I couldn't really describe eye communication and gestures and body language and posture, you know, posture whatever. So I did this interview to, to show all that. And several, a lot of colleges bought that, a lot of corporations bought that to show their interviewers how to, how to look for different parts of interviewing. And one, several states had the series of booklets that I did uh, that had all the information, I took chapters out of my job search 101 and created little booklets. So many states just had a, a package of booklets. Everyone, when they signed up for their unemployment benefits, got a package of my booklets, so, and they had to watch the Art of Interviewing video. So it sold a lot of these to state governments. Also sold the booklets to colleges because the students didn't want to pay $14.95 for a book, so they they bought the, the booklets. Finding new users and new uses, an example of that, where I had this program, this book, Employment Connections. I did this for different states and sold this to the, the state governments and, and uh, counselors who were helping their clients find employment. And this was a listing of all the job search supports, support groups, and uh, different services that could help the people looking for a job. I did that for a variety of different states. I had this translated into Spanish, Job Search 101 translated into Spanish. And that was quite a quite an, uh, a venture. <laughs> it took a, a lot of m more time than I thought. The first translation was uh, El Trabajo 101, which sounded very good to me, but certainly that was not a, a book that uh, the, the Jobs 101 course is a very basic course but only in the U.S. It meant nothing outside the U.S. So I learned the definition of one word in Spanish, of, of manana. <laughs> when will my translation be done, uh, manana? I learned that manana doesn't mean tomorrow. It means not today. So it's a big difference. But the point I want to make is how you can extend that job, that uh, life cycle, by coming up with new users, new uses, new formats, some creative promotion, and built a product line around that. Where I had, I started out with these these books, uh, the job search type books, and then it's once the the uh, economy got better, I had the art of interviewing, which was gestures and facial expression, posture, and so forth. And so I did took that same information and created "You're on the Air," which was about performing on TV and radio shows for authors, and wrote the two books to accompany that. It's Showtime and Perpetual Promotion. Then extended those into a variety of 11 different book marketing books. I did the uh, Words Worth, Get Your Words Worth, was an example of the e-books I did. Then this special sales books. And, and these are, uh, the, are, are not uh, only one for sale now is how to make real money selling books. But the others are out of print. But I just wanted to show you how you can build a, a complete product line for special sales marketing and extend your, your revenue, your profit over, over years. It's not that much different from what you're already doing. So think about some of the marketing techniques that you already do. <clears throat> Selling through bookstores, whether it's online or whether it's uh, Independence or Barnes and Nobles. <clears throat> doing e-commerce, selling through your website. Perhaps selling your rights to it, the, the direct mail marketing to the, uh, whether email or snail mail. And then the international sales, the foreign rights. These are all the things that most people do 
right away and and or over the, they think this is book marketing but that's less than half the size of the opportunity the total market is, is about 60 billion dollars in the u.s for books and, and or, uh, so it's about 30 million 30 billion i'm sorry and it's about 14 billion is in the trade and about 16 billion is in this uh, non-trade non-bookstore area that's comprised of a variety of air, perhaps three major areas of third-party sales where you contact the book clubs and home shopping networks and display marketers like Scholastic uh, or the, the catalogs. The non-retail, the corporations, associations, libraries, schools, military, and non-retail buyers. Again, depending on what your content is and who your target readers are, you can sell through gift shops and airport stores and supermarkets and pharmacies and museums and uh, just it's just museum gift shops and national national parks and state parks wherever so this is really a uh, what special sales marketing does and how it can add to what you're already doing so there's not a major difference and I'll show you the how it's very similar in some cases <clears throat> so what makes a, a sale special it's a I'll show you a, com a comparison sheet here and this will be a, something I'll send to you that you have the difference between traditional book marketing and special sales marketing. Special sales in the right-hand column, where I've highlighted some of these in red, where there are much fewer seasonal variations. Where in the, the trade, you may be selling books for the fourth quarter gift period or the May, June, July, Mother's Day, Father's Day graduation period. But in uh, the corporate sales particularly, or, or the association sales or non-retail sales are much fewer variations. The market, the decisions are based on, on marketing decisions, not uh, uh, literary decisions. Where the in the bookstores, they're also making marketing decisions, but reviewers are they're looking on the the basis of how well written it is. Or, so the marketing decision is based upon can the content help my company sell more of my product or help my employees become more productive, more uh, motivated, more more or less absent. The emphasis is on selling the content, not on publishing more books, because a lot of people think well, sales are down, publishers particularly, uh, sales are down, so then let's uh, let's sell more books. Well, the idea is you want to sell, we want, let's, let's publish more books. Well, the idea is that you want to sell what you already have, so the front list and back list become similar, because the, the, the copyright data is not as important as the applicability of the content to the, to the buyers. Opportunity to find new customers, I just demonstrated that, and Buyers are more concentrated. When I found I could sell to colleges, state governments, there's just single people to contact, and they're well or known people to contact. I could buy lists of these people, I have direct contact with them. And you're selling through the trade. You sell you'll, your contact is with a distributor or maybe the the buyer at the retail outlet. But in, in here, the with special sales, you have direct contact with the the person who's going to buy ten thousand books or more from you. The it may take a year or more to decide because if they're trying to buy ten thousand books, then certainly they they want they will take the time to make that happen. The ability to meet the the uh, the needs of niche buyers, so the unique the, the unique value, the unique proposition, the unique value of your book is varied by niche because the uh, they have this when you when you organize your uh, buyers by or by group, by niche, by segment, which I show you how to do in the uh, BSU 101, then you create special content and customize the book for them. The author's credibility is more important in the uh, special sales marketplace. And in the trade, the more well-known you are, then the more likely you are to sell. But here, it's, you, know, you don't need to be well-known. You need to be, have, have credible content and have the credentials to demonstrate why you are the, the person who's most likely the best to buy that. The audience segments we talked about, the personal selling is something that you're direct marketing to that. Less price competition. When you in, uh, have your books on a bookshelf, people can evaluate immediately your competitive products by content and by price. When you're selling to a corporate buyer or an association or a non-retail buyer, they are just evaluating your, your book versus their needs. A lot of sales are uh, re non-returnable, particularly in the non-retail sector. Most, almost all are in the non-retail sector. And because you have that non-returnability, you don't have distribution discounts, and you're selling in larger quantities. So your 
printing costs are lower, so you have much lower break-even point. You can customize the books for your buyers. It could be a, a logo on the cover or a tip-in page. And you, you're, 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 it's low because you're, the, uh, the customer acquisition cost is low. Because if you're selling through bookstores, if you want to sell 10,000 books, you have to get 10,000 people to each buy one. We're in special sales. You can get one person to buy 10,000. A lot much, a lot more profitable. So your your acquisition costs are significantly less, which just again contributes to your profitability. The discounts in non, well, they're negotiated, but in non-retail there are no uh, distribution discounts. So you can apply that discount to a uh, dollars off or percentage off the sale. The overall strategy you're selling to non-retailers and sell, selling through retailers. And the promotion, because they're segmented, you're, you're narrow casting versus broadcasting. So you're talking in, immediately to the, the needs of each segment and the benefits of that. You can be creative in, in the sales long term. And the because you're segmented, your promotion is more effective and efficient. So you're spending less money on, on the promotion because you can get directly to these people. So let's look at some of the basic assumptions for special sales. One, I tell people, stop selling your books. <laughs> Sell what the book does. For example, just think about this product. You know, how is that used? Perhaps as a deodorant and recipes and a deodorizer, uh, toothpaste, uh, putting out fires, a lot of different ways. But the product itself has not changed. And it's the same with your book. The book is used by retailers, uh, not your book, the, the the, well, yeah, the, the, the retailers are looking at your book, but they want product on the shelf that will generate store traffic and help them be more profitable. If your book won't do it, they'll get something else on there. And or the the, the media is looking for a good a guest, a, a content that will help their, their audience in some way. The library is looking for something to help their patrons. So it's the same same book, but people are using it in different ways. That's the, the major key to look at that. Revive your backlist because when somebody's looking for a book or content to help them sell more of their product, it doesn't have to be a front list title. They don't care as long as the content is current and it's uh, applicable to their cause, their needs. They're more willing to buy it. And this works in fiction and in nonfiction. There are the military, for example, buys a lot of fiction and. Uh, the concept of product placement. We sell a lot of books where we change the generic name to a brand name of a, of a car or of a, a soda or of a, a, a beer or a whatever. We just change it from a generic car to a brand name and then go to that manufacturer to get them to sponsor the, the, the book. And that, that's worked in many cases. So you can sell it in retail is particularly uh, beneficial for selling fiction in non-bookstore markets. The airport stores, for example, supermarkets, they're all selling a lot of fiction for their, their customers. The different pricing strategies that in, in retailing, you're looking at dollars off list price, where in the special sales, you're looking at cost plus, where the large quantity sales, you have a lower cost per unit cost, so you just add a percentage on there for the uh, the cost of the, the the price of the book, and then th that's how you price it. Not it's it's uh, cost plus versus discount off the list. Each sale is different. Well, this really makes it fun too. You're not just calling your distributor and uh, calling a retailer and trying to get them to buy your book. You're doing this something that you if you call a retailer, calling a chain of shoe stores for example, and get them to if you have a children's book line, you get them which is what we set up for this this program with a uh, a a uh, chain of children's shoes and they had a, a, a program where they uh, created a punch card when the parents bought x dollars of shoes they got a card punch they got four of these punches and they the kids could download or buy or, or were given not buy they were given a book with the shoe store's logo on it <clears throat> this campaign was we take care of your child from head to toe and it went over really well but that was so that's something that, that works in a, in a creative sales technique. <clears throat> Increase your revenue by selling more, not publishing more. So you don't you don't have to put all the money into producing other books. You put the money into marketing those that you already have, and that 
it, it makes you you're not putting the money into that big hole in the in the water that you just you're getting more revenue from existing titles and the you start thinking in ter- long term results where it might take you a, a year or so to make that sale but but when you get it you get uh, we had <clears throat> you get results we had one client that had a book it was about uh, eating healthy through cancer and it was it was a book about when you're going through chemotherapy or radiation that you have a diet to help you be as healthy as you can through that. And, and, and it was pretty, this, she was in our program about three years and, and a pharmaceutical so pharmaceutical company bought 32,000 copies of it with their logo on it and gave it to doctors. And then the doctors gave it to their patients who were using their chemotherapy products. And it went, they, so, so nice sale of 32,000 books. So, but it took a long term, it took three years to get that sale. <clears throat> so what are the steps for selling books in special markets? First of all, well, you want to understand what special sales is or what non-bookstore marketing is. And, and now you do, or, or you, by the end of this webinar, you certainly have a lot better feel for it. Then you want to define and segment your target buyer, your tire buyers and readers and buyers. So you're not selling to everybody. People, I hear this almost every day. That who's your target market? Well, everybody who likes whatever. <laughs> it just doesn't work. So one segment of special sales marketing is retail. Here, it's just like selling through bookstores, you have to create your distribution, and then it, once you get the distribution set up, you do all the promotion, and the distributors get the books to the retailers, and they put the books on their shelf, and your the your promotion sells books. Then you, you prospect for other buyers. You have it in airport stores. Now you want to go to supermarkets or discount stores or cruise ships, uh, uh, gift shops on cruise ships. Again, depending on your target segment, if it's a more affluent segment, you want to be on cruise ships. If it's a, le- a lower demog- or lower uh, economic target, then maybe you want to be in Walmart. So that's why it's important to define your target readers and buyers. So the retail segment is one part non-retail is the other where there, this could be the associations and corporations and military and the, the schools and, and the other parts i pointed out before and so you have your initial meeting you, you find the, who these these prospects are you, you call them up and make an appointment and you you might even get the order in the first call if it's a small or a small business they, they could order a couple of cases of books or 100 books or 500 books or whatever you get a small order and then you come back and you prospect for more buyers because you've got these people in the loop already. So now you go out and find new buyers. So if you don't sell a an order on the first initial meeting, then you write a proposal. That you find that initial meeting gives you all the information that you need to create your proposal. You want to find out what their uh, what their objectives are, what their history was. Have they ever used books before as a as a promotional item? And then you write that uh, appropriately. You make your sales presentation, then you negotiate the order. So those are the steps. We have a lot of courses that help you do this. The This is the books BSU 100 to help you understand that. And we have 101, which is about defining your target readers. And we have we have over 60 courses in, in place now with experts on a variety of different topics, like for finding distribution and also for uh, coming up with that initial meeting. How do you make that happen? How do you do a, a sales presentation? How do you negotiate large orders? So we have the courses on, on all these, how to, how to do foreign rights, how to do p- p- publicity, how to do audio books, so these, the legal aspects of special sales. So we have, as I said, over, uh, over 60 courses ready to get to you, and uh, we can help you in many ways sell a lot of, a lot of books in, in non-bookstore markets. So why do you want to go through all this? <laughs> well, here's a picture of a bookstore. It's not atypical, but it, what if your book is up in the top row or in the bottom row or, or just jammed in among all the others? It's very difficult to find these. It doesn't look like there are any categories on here, so people, their books are just up on the shelves. And that's not a great way to, to get your book sold. A lot of people even put their books on consignment in this environment, which is not the, a good way to go because the books, if they're on the bottom shelf or underneath the table, they're just not going to sell. And then you get them back a couple of weeks later or months later, and they're all torn apart and you can't sell them. At any rate, 
you don't want to go through this, so you want to sell to these non-bookstore buyers. So what are some of the benefits of doing that? Well, obviously, increased revenue. That because your acquisition costs are lower, you're, you're, you're making uh, more money, you're increasing, uh, you're selling your books to, to larger quantities and to, to different people. So you're making more money. It's, you can look at increasing your sales and your revenue and profits. They all have different ways of selling and different benefits for that in special sales. The recurring revenue is important because they'll have companies that place what they call a blanket order. I had a, a book, Job Search 101, I took to a state government and they said, we love your book, but we're not going to buy it. So why not? So we'll, we do workshops for the unemployed. And you can't, a perfect bound book just doesn't lay flat, so we're not going to buy it. So I took it to Staples and I cut off the binding or they cut off the binding, put a wire binding in it. I took it back and they, lo they love the content of the book, so they bought it. They placed what's called a blanket order for 8,000 books a quarter. So each quarter I knew I was having 8,000 books, and I had print those up and then went to other states and said, here's what this state is doing. You can do others. And, oh, by the way, do you need somebody to work your, your, to uh, perform, conduct your workshops? Well, I can do that. So I got paid for that, too. The lower unit costs and higher you're printing in higher quantities. So the higher the quantity, the lower the unit cost. Again, contributing to your your profitability. So you're becoming more profitable. Greater total sales. That uh, you have these uh, recurring re uh, revenue, or recurring blanket orders. You have books through uh, sales through all these different segments, and the competition is less because one most authors and publishers are not doing this. They're not going to call on the on the, on the corporate buyers and you don't have to do this yourself you mean uh, i'll talk a little bit more about this later that you don't have to go out and make the sales calls there are companies that can do that for you and rep groups and uh, so that's the idea is that someone has to make up the personal presentation there it doesn't have to be you but your agent can do that less discounting because there is no there is less competition they don't have the people right on the on the shelf next to you so the the buyers are not looking they're not looking at other books necessarily. They're looking at your book vis-a-vis -vis their objectives and their needs and their, their history and their future. Fewer returns in, in non-retail area, there are no returns. If they put their logo on the cover, it's their book. <laughs> so they've, they're have not going to send it back. And because it's segmented, you have these groups of people that you have the bookstores, the media. You may have a children's book selling it to daycare centers or to homeschooling or to children's libraries or uh, children's museums or government agencies or uh, toy stores. Each one of those has a, uh, a list of people you can buy. They have media that can reach them. So you, your, your promotion is much more effective and efficient. You're not spending as much. Negotiable terms, and that's because you can negotiate the, uh, the discount, the shipping terms, the shipping price, the shipping location, the customization, the uh, delivery time, all these are negotiable and price certainly. So it gives you a lot more flexibility of, of coming up with a more profitable item that improves your cash flow. So these are some of the benefits you'll find with non-bookstore marketing. But given all those benefits and those reasons, why, why don't some people do that? Well, this is something that I've thought about a long time. That they have, have the status quo that no problems, things are going well. I'm selling some books through bookstores. I do a few store events and I'm selling 50 books a month. And some people think that's a lot, but it's, it's uh, they then some opportunity occurs outside their comfort zone. Maybe they get a call from a company who wants to buy some of their books, or maybe they, uh, they think about, well, I could sell this book to somebody else. But it happens outside their comfort zone. And they, they may think, well, I don't know how to do that, so I'm not going to try it. Or, I don't I don't want to sell. I don't have the skills to do it. I don't have the, the time to do it. And I, I don't have the desire to sell. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I stay inside my comfort zone. Well, then that's, if you do that, then you just, you, you're not getting all those benefits we just talked about. So the idea is that you have to go outside your comfort zone sometimes. And, and if, you may not have the time or the desire or the skill to sell. Well, you solve the problem. What you need to do is find an agent, find someone who can do that for you. And that's how you can join apps, join the Association of Publishers for Special Sales. And you take courses on how to do that in our book selling university.
So there are a lot of ways. Once you have the the need and you see that that carrot out there, I should have put that dot in the shape of a carrot. But uh, they just go outside your your comfort zone, and when you do that, your comfort zone expands. You get you, once you have that that uh, out here. Once you do that, then your comfort zone expands a lot, and then you have an opportunity out here. This this carrot. Uh, see what a carrot looks like. There's carrots out here, orange carrot. And then you solve that, and your comfort zone increases like that. Pretty, you know, that could take a year, could ten, five years, ten years, whatever. But at least you're coming up with new ways to uh, to grow, and so you're growing personally, you're growing professionally, and you're growing uh, financially. So a lot of benefits to this. We're not saying I'm not, and apps is not telling you to sell just to to ignore bookstores, think about dual distribution, where you're selling through bookstores as well as non-bookstore buyers. So you have the same inventory, but you sell, you're selling it in, in two different ways, of retail and non-retail. The retail includes bookstores, so because you're, you're selling the same way to bookstore, to airport stores as you, as you do through bookstores, so it's not that, that different. So there, as I showed before, there are two segments of special sales of retail and non-retail. So look at these a little bit more closely now. Of the retail, you have the publisher or the author at the bottom, and you have the ultimate consumer. This would be the, the person who's at the who's buying the book off the shelf. This could be the author or the publisher. And here the first step is to come up with a distributor or a wholesaler. They're different. For a bookstore, you may just go through Ingram or through uh Midpoint or IPG or Cardinal or whatever there, but there's different distributors for for discount stores or warehouse clubs, and some distributors like Cymac will contact most of these, or uh, ReaderLink they'll, they'll contact most of these. Uh, Neutral Books goes to health stores, or Select Media goes to business stores, office supply stores. But the thing is, you, you all you do is create the distribution, and then they take care of all the selling for you. They call on these people. And no, no, but the arrows here go both ways. <laughs> the books are returnable. Then you can go, you don't need a distributor to call on home shopping networks or book clubs or catalogs or display marketing companies. They'll, they pretty much act as your distributor. So all you do is, is, is reach them, get your books in them, and then they, they take over. So it's a, it's just like you're selling through, through a bookstore. And if, if you want to sell with retail, if you want to sell 10,000 books, you, you want you have to find 10,000 people to buy it. And that's where the expense comes in. So you need to come up with these people doing all your promotion, selling through the distribution network. But also distributors and retailers don't sell books. The retailers display them, and then the distributors fill the pipeline when they're sold. It's up to the author. You're doing what's called pull marketing, contacting these people, the consumers and getting them to go to the retailer to, to get your book. And your relationship is down, is down here with, with the wholesalers, with the distributors. You're not, you're not reaching the people who are most likely to, or most important in, in, the, in the sale. And you're selling books off the shelf. The cover design is critical, certainly. It's a very important part of it, as is your promotion. The books are returnable, and you may get paid in 120 days, and that's, uh, that's before returns. So it's something that it's not the the most profitable way of selling, but it's the most similar to what you're already doing. All you do is set up the distribution and they take over after that. The other segment is non-retail. Here you're contacting the corporations, the governments, the, the state governments, agencies, the associations, armed forces, uh, schools, libraries. You contact them. It will libraries you, you and you'll have a wholesale like Baker and Taylor. Or uh, through schools, you can sell directly to the homeschooling segment or to military schools, but uh, all through associations. But here you, you're selling, you want to sell 10,000 books just to one person. And that's a lot more lucrative way to sell. And you're not selling books, you're selling, you're solving the problems. Uh, we had a, one client that wanted to reduce absenteeism and inc increase productivity and they want to reduce their health care costs. So we had a book on uh, on walking. And they had 10,000 employees. So we set up a continuity program where month one, each employee got a book on walking. Month two, each employee got a pedometer. Uh, and 
all 10,000 employees. In month three, a journal to keep track of their exercise. And they hired the, uh, the author of the walking book as a spokesman, and they paid him to go around the country and talk to all their employees about the benefits of a healthy lifestyle. So we solved their problems. Their absenteeism went down, the healthcare costs went down, and productivity went up. You know, they, they weren't buying books. They were buying a solution to their problem. And that's the biggest difference in, in non-retail marketing. So you're selling the content, the solution. You're selling directly to the buyers, or you're getting an agent to do that for you. Uh, faster cash flow, no returns. A lot of these are a lot of the benefits we looked at before. So, But these decisions are based on cost and based on uh, the, the solution to this. They are... You, you, have competition in a, in a sense that your competition is not other books. Your competition may be a coffee mug or a baseball cap or an umbrella. So they're looking at the the likelihood of that product creating uh, reaching their objectives most most effectively and efficiently. This is important here that once the sale is made, you have to do the support. You have to make sure that the books are printed on time and delivered properly. But that may just take a call to your printer, and it's. It, but, the, the sale, I look at it, the sale is not made, the first sale is not made until they order again. And then that means that they're satisfied with it. Where in retail, that you don't even know who the person is buying your book. There are ways of finding that out, which we can talk about later. But the, the creative selling and the building relationships with, with those people who are prospective buyers. It's not the, uh, the, in the retail where you're looking at the, or the relationships are with those people that are not even related or have, have not associated with your your buyers, I should say. So how can Book Selling University help you? This is something that, that uh, is an apps program that is a, an online on-demand university where you can have access to a lot of courses and you take these on on your leisure and on your time. You don't have to come here at uh, a particular time when a course is being offered that you just, you get this and you can view it on your own. So you can take these as your time permits. And, and there are instructors on a variety of different courses that we have on. These are some of the courses that are, are available. So you have experts on, on all these topics and all, in special sales, but also in, in non-bookstore marketing. I mean, in, in trade marketing, how to, how to get distribution, how to get distribution to bookstores and libraries and fulfillment, selling to different segments and promotion. All these different things are different courses that we that you can have in Book Selling University. We have networking opportunities that on the website for the university that you have these different groups. You have the, um, each course will have a, a, a group where you can, the students can go <laughs> and talk among themselves and then the instructors will, will come here. They'll be monitored by the instructors too. So we have a lot of these courses that are, that each course will have this forum for that and we have this is something that you'll be uh, receiving also as part of this course is that a, a fast start checklist where the sequentially things that you can do to get started in, in special sales so don't look at all oh, this is something you have to do all at one time it's, it's not you can do something today and then just try something different tomorrow and, and something this will help you do everything in, in the right sequence of events so you find out, you define your target readers and, and buyers. You find out, ask who else, find out the right, right form. Prior, you contact, you prioritize the prospects and contact them. Uh, then you you contact the, those are long lead times first. So then those people are, they're making their decisions while you're selling the uh, to the short term and to the, uh, the retail sector. Retail generally, if you don't sell a book in 90 days, it's off the shelf. So you're, you're more likely to get that revenue and from that. So Book Selling University can help you do all this. So you're not on your own. We're here to help you. Perhaps the Association of Publishers for Special Sales is here to help you go through all this and to be successful and to, to uh, reach your goals. Now, did you ever think your book was associated with Chinese bamboo? <laughs> well, if you look at this, that year one, if you plant a, a bamboo plant, you nurture it and you water it and you give it plenty of light and you talk nicely to it, it'll grow two inches. In year two, if you water it and give it lots of light and nurture it and, and talk to it, it grows two more inches. In year three, you do the same thing. You nurture it and water it and give it light and talk to it nicely and, and it grows two more inches. 
year four, you do all the same thing and, and it grows two more inches. This is something that it, it's a lot like authors and publishers that they do this and say, I've been beating my head against the wall for four years and I've, I've sold a hundred books or a thousand books or whatever. And I'm, I'm just going to quit. I'm not going to do anymore. So after four years, they quit. But when bamboo in the, in the year five, it grows 80 feet, not because of what you did in year five, but because of what you did in year one, two, three, and four. That's the same as selling books, that what you do this year and next year, the next four years, you may be setting the stage for year five when it, when it takes off. It may happen in year three for books or maybe in year four. You don't know, but you have to keep at it. You just don't know when it's going to take off. So nurture your book and give it time to grow. And special sales can help. Book Selling University can help. And the Association of Publishers for Special Sales can help. So thank you for attending Book Selling University 101 course. And uh, you'll have the handouts momentarily. And we look forward to helping you be successful and productive in your non-bookstore marketing.